But so I think we could start. I first of all want to thank you all for coming. I haven't given a class here I don't think in a long time. I'm so thrilled that other faculty members do. It's been a wonderful thing, I think, to, to very much to get And I want you all to participate as well today, sort of ask questions and so on. When I woke up this morning, I thought, what, what to say? I've done classes and I've performed, toured with various universities and colleges. But you know, this is home. So it's a little different to speak at home about music matters. But when it's called a master class, I get a little concerned because, you know, as recreative artists, which as performers we are, the master really is the composer. I mean, this is where we get our imagination, it's where we get our inspiration. So what we might want to talk about today is how do we get that kind of inspiration from those strange little scribbles that are on the printed page. Sometimes they are done well by editors over the years. Sometimes the editors have been, uh, sometimes their own judge about what the composer wrote, what it looked like. So quite often in editions, which we have to rely upon, there will be a lot of disparity. But, um, that's another one of our obligations. And in a way, that word obligation is probably part of what brings us all to the kind of work which we want to do. Responsibility about ourselves, being musicians, being interested in music. It is an obligation and a responsibility. Music, someone has said so often, definitions of what music is. What I just saw recently was it's called the voice of the soul. And I think that is a tremendously wonderful way of describing what music is. Because that's not just for those of us who are in music, but it's for everybody everywhere. And other people who are in music, as we know, all kinds of music. And I think we can relish that there are many kinds of music as well. I think we can be very happy there is. But today we're going to talk about some special music. Um, and I want you to understand that I have a few thoughts that I want to say about performance. And that gives me a chance to have a little, a little platform here, literally. Somebody just asked me, by the way, um, about this building. And it was, um, this is too loud. I'm not trying to talk about too soon. The reason I needed a microphone because I don't want to shout. Now it sounds like I'm shouting. There was a, a church uh, in the Grange, which was going to be torn down, turned into two weeks. And fortunately, some people in that congregation thought of us and said, would you like to have it? So of course, the obligation, we'll come back to that word again, was for how to get it here, number one where to put it, and could we really do it? Well, we did it. We have even a video of about 25 minutes of this building. It took about two hours to come from the range. We have a video at it coming in. So it's really fascinating, and I think if you ever want to see it, it's on the website. So it might be interesting. Now that you're inside it, it might be interesting for you to see just how it got here. Now we're using it. Um, we were given a wonderful organ, uh, which was made in New York by a man named Henry Urban in the mid-1800s. And it was given to us, and we've installed here. If you turn around, you'll see a little tiny organ back there, which was made where? In Round Top. About the same year as Henry Urban made this organ in New York. He made it in 1500 of which there are about five extant now. Trump and Bonke, who lived here at Brown Town and made that one, built, I think, about three. This is the first one we built. Out of 80 cedar. So I love the juxtaposition of these two together, uh, far from where the original was made in New York, and 
that's so close to where this one was built right here in downtown. Unusual, I think. That's one of the good things I think about Festival Hill is that so many matters here are of a human scale. And that's, if anything in music, that's what we're all about as well. To, to we want to offer music on a basis that's not just performance, but also in giving. Last week I played a work by Beethoven and at the closing concert we'll do another one. But one thing Beethoven said is about his music, that his music was from the heart to the heart. Well that means a lot, doesn't it? And particularly in today's age when we are now so so now getting away from maybe some of that wonderful thought. Mozart also said he wrote the notes that love one another, which is a beautiful example of wording as well, I think. So when we keep all those things in mind, we become, I think, already advancing in our appreciation and perhaps even our abilities as musicians and as the public, which we all are. Um, I'm so glad that some of, you, some of you who are in our wonderful chamber orchestra are here as well today. Because it gives me a chance to talk a little bit about that. And about the score. I mentioned at the beginning that there's no master class here. We are, the master is really what we are obligated what we work with. But obviously, when we've had the fortune to have great mentors and teachers, there are thoughts and ideas that come about. And particularly when you have worked a long time uh, with people, there are some valuable ideas that come about. Every year when I teach a few pianists here, I always try to mention, I don't want to tell you how to play it, but I hope that maybe some ideas will be forthcoming that you can not only use in the music you're playing now, but some of the ideas that will transfer to other music that you play. To my mind, that's in the short length of time, certainly, that we have here. Uh, it seems to me that's a, a rather good idea. Rather than tell somebody how to play something, to say, well, let's look at this music and see what it tells us. Sometimes we don't always perceive even that. So that when we go back for a second time, maybe we a piece of music, they follow for a while, and then we come back to it, and surprisingly, we might even fall off the bench when we're looking at that music because God, I've never noticed that before. Or I've never seen the same when I first started that. So even with those printed notes that are there permanently on the page, there can be an infinite amount of thought in it. And you know another thing. What happens between the notes that are on the printed page? I mean, that's, that's one of the great discoveries as well because they're all delineated. And if you know about music, they're, they're all rather separated, sort of, in a way. But what happens in between where there's no note? Well, that's where the lovely magic, the lovely, wonderful, mysterious mystery happens, it seems. It's what happens between the notes. One of the things that I read about Beethoven was that it is, in, in, in his music, the rests, which mean the pauses or the time in between notes or between phrases, the rest are almost more important in some instances than the actual notes themselves. Well, what does that mean? I think it means that in our own life, when we're quiet, we may be talking to someone, but we, when we're quiet finally, sometimes that quietness has a real impact. And it's the same way in music, all the same story. So then we come back to the idea that music really is a kind of I don't want to call it ordinariness, which it isn't. But yet some of the same values that we might feel in our life certainly transfer themselves as we study and become musicians, which I think we all wish for. And if not musicians in, in the playing terms, but as musicians in our enjoyment and our understanding of music. All those matters, I think, are, are, are so valuable to think about. Now that I have a chance to say a couple of other things, 
I, I want to say that when we look at a score of music, the composers have a length of note too. Some notes are longer than others, some are very short. But in performance, I hope that all of us who are musicians and performers will take the score and see what we have there and fulfill that score. I hear so often now that long notes are forgotten. They're stopped. Well, why would a composer take time to write a half note and this note, sometimes add a dot to the end of it, and not want that whole note to be left as a sound? It seems like today, and this is one of my pet peeves, I'll tell you, is when I hear an orchestra play and they just chop off the ends of notes. I love for the notes to continue and be fulfilled. And that's what maybe, as pianists, we have a problem with. Because as soon as we touch a note, as soon as we depress that note, that button, the sound begins to disintegrate. So in other words, we have to kind of do some kind of strange manipulation on our own. That is to see that that note continues somehow in direction, if not in sound. Whereas if you're a string player, you've got a wonderful bow to continue making that. If you're a woodwind player, woodwind, woodwind player, you've got breath to keep the note going. But as a pianist, you only have the direction of the point. Kelly and Forrest have heard this over and over, I know. But it still bears, I think, uh, mention. And I want to mention it to all of you because it's something I think we don't, we don't think about enough when we're listening to. Now, I want all of you to have questions as well. But I think we also need to have some music. And I've asked both Kelly and Forrest, the two pianists attending, which I'm so proud that they're here this year. As I was saying, Kelly started the Royal College of Music in London, and now she's living in Washington and working there. Forrest is from South Korea originally, and goes to the University of Michigan working on his doctorate. And it's a great pleasure to have both of them here today. Um, and I've asked them to play some. Um, they're playing on Saturday afternoon at 1.30. We have a concert called Piano Galore. And they're both of them playing quite extensively. So I would certainly encourage you all to come hear them as well. But I thought this afternoon would be interesting to hear some music that Kelly had brought, which I'm very pleased about. We don't have enough music, I think, everywhere, although we have certainly done a lot here written by women composers. And they, of course, are more abundant than I think we're, many of us are aware of. But one that was so uh, important and also neglected was a, a, a woman named Lily Boulanger, who was a sister to a great musician named Nadia Boulanger. And Kelly brought some of her works, and I'd like for her to, to play one of them for us now. Kelly? pieces. She died when she was 25. Um, and so these pieces were written in 1914, about um, two or three years before she passed away. Uh, and it's um, the first one, the title is in French, it's in an old garden. The second one is in a clear garden. And then the third one is cortege. Um, very interesting harmonies. They're all very short and very whimsical. So, 
I can, sure. Whatever we have time for. <laughs>
pieces, really. Um, and thank you for, for playing them, too. What, what appeals, as a, as a listening people, what, what appeal to you in these pieces? Tell me. Yes. Waterfall, a cool drink of water, a lot of water themes. Oh, so it gives you an image. Yeah, water. Just energy. You know, national why, parks and water. Why, and why that? What is the flow? Um, the cascading of the notes kind of corresponds, but just, it was easy and free and just kind of light, like you said. Right. So, in other words, music can really give us a lot of images too. Anybody else? That's interesting. What, anyone else? Yes? Um, how her head seemed to be like a dancer. A dancer? Yes. A ballerina dancer. Very, very graceful. And you know, in a way, on, on piano, we have a situation we always have to keep in mind, and that is almost a choreographic where you go. And, and, and Lily Boulanger and her music has an incredible expanse. Here we have at the very bottom of the, of the the very base, almost the last note of the piano, and then she cascades into all kinds of other areas of the piano too. So, in other words, part of our occupation and interpretation is deciding what do we do, where do we, how do we get there, how, what kind of thing do we got to put. In other words, there are a lot of obligations we have to make uh, a piece of music uh, come alive as well. So, dancing, movement, flow. Yes, yeah, all that. Anything else? Yes? Calming. It was very calming. I'm sorry? It was calming. Calm. 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 Well, there are moments. Uh, that sort of gets me to one other thing I want to mention, because even within the movement, the flow, the, the rhythm, there are moments of repose, too. And that's what I think makes music so amenable to all of us is that we not only have sometimes the energy of a piece of music, but we have that wonderful ability that we need to listen, just as we do in conversation, just as we do sometimes to what we're feeling inside ourselves, too. We have to listen. And I think all those things are so inherent in music and in the, in the score. So if you ever have a chance to look at a piece of music, even if you don't play an instrument, look at it as a piece of art, too. Because you'll see kind of an ebb and flow of what the music and the notes are doing, as we have to try to find what they mean as recreators, which we are. We're not, we're not creating the music, but we're trying to find what the music really is meaning. Just as we look at something like a, a, a stained glass window, and we see the variety of colors, the uprush of color, the variance of color, the same thing happens in, in, in music as well. And one of the things, um, Kelly, I want to point out, that when we have a similar note, <coughs> we talk about this, that sometimes a similar note in its expression can be a different thought, a different expression, uh, so that we're also enlivening the score by, by considering many, many matters, and that's certainly one of them. Anything else? Yes, sorry. The richness of the, the chords and the way they're put together is just so original. So you're surprised by you know, the movement between the chords and the richness of the sound. That's a very interesting point. I'm glad somebody pointed out this. Music should surprise us. If it gets to be ordinary, and we're, we may, even those of us who are working with the same score time after time, we let it go for a while and come back to it. If we don't enliven our thought about what that music is saying, that becomes rather stagnant, rather repetitive, and frankly, boring. And a score like these are not. I mean, they're, they're lively. And I, and I really think Kelly has a certain empathy with his music, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kelly, I hate to voice this on anybody, but what do you have to do? as well as the easy nature of it. There's so much going on in this music, so many interesting chordal harmonies. 
but you don't hear the complexity. It feels like a walk on a cool breezy day to me, which is pretty remarkable given how busy it is from a music theory standpoint. Um, but it really strikes me, and I first learned this piece about three years ago and I've just recently brought it back, how young she was when she wrote this um, and how much emotional depth I continue to find in it and musical depth in it. In other words, genius is not just anyone but someone who really wants to give. And obviously, Lily Blanche wanted to give something, wanted to say something. And isn't it wonderful that in the arts, those things still live? Thank you. Uh, years later, Bach was discovered by Mendelssohn. He had been totally ignored. But here his music was still living, still available, and Mendelssohn found it. And the world is richer for it. And so as recreators, as musicians, we have that obligation to, to, to make music live and to reestablish and reinterpret and see what's happening that may be different than just the ordinary. We don't want to repeat something. I think we've got to the point where we have so many recordings, video, CDs, YouTube, we can listen to all that and get ideas, and I think that is almost the death of a likeness. To be able to have your own courage to say what you feel and be honest about the score, I mean, that is our kind of revelation. We have to go by that. But again, what does the score say? What happens in between the notes? That's something we all can breathe and decide upon. We can decide tempting, we can decide our our color, whatever we want to do. So we still have the most perfect freedom. The score is not a prison. It's really a, a perfect freedom about what we want to do. Yes, the notes are there. But what happens again? And I want to just reiterate. What happens between the notes? That's what's really important. How, what, how do we time that? How do we feel it? How do we color it? How do we produce it? Those are all the matters I think that we have as our most wonderful freedom to do. Yes? Does that change over time for you, your interpretation of the area between the notes, how much resonance it gives, you know, you yes. Okay. yes. I mean, we still have time. We still have some kind of structure that we must still exist in. All that is terribly important. And if we are so free, that we lose the structure, that we lose the time we're playing, then that's really not freedom, that kind of, what would we call it? Quite often a mess. It's, uh, it's just too much of a good thing sometimes. We still have got to make certain we understand structure and where, where the music actually is going. Yeah. Yes? Say. 
And in a way, it can't be said any other way than through what we're working with. I can't say to that person what I was thinking necessarily, except just that. And then my sister. I think what I heard was sort of a brilliance. It was very evocative. She was, she was in a garden kind of walking, that's the flow. And as she turned from plant to plant to plant, it was a surprise around every corner. That's what I heard. It was a brilliance. It was, there was no sadness. There was no uh, watching a plant die or anything like that. It, it, was, it was the joy of the surprise. It was the here and now. That's, that's a very interesting comment, Scott. Because, you know, as we look at, at a painting, too, and quite often, I mean, the French were so beautiful in their expression about nature and the beauty of, of gardens, and all kinds of matters, that, and the color that's brought out in that, too. Um, we can experience it because we are only viewing it, but we should get something from it when it is said strongly and with real conviction. And I think that's one of the things that I find in Lily Boulanger's music. She says what she has to say very strongly, even though it may be in very simple terms. She says it very strongly. And that, that's, that's important for any creative artist to be able to do, to say something strongly, even though it may be quiet. You think that's yes? Are there any recordings of her playing this piece? <laughs> well, I'm just curious. I think so I it would be pretty scratchy, but yeah. okay. it would be possible. We didn't get it, but we should. <laughs> oh. I think I think uh, Kelly's going to be performing these again on. No, no, no I meant the old Saturday. Oh, yes. so is there any old recording of her playing? So, so this is strictly your interpretation. No, I don't think so. You know, it's a very interesting point. Quite often, the composers themselves there are some recordings that we have. Sometimes they're really well outlandish and bad. It's really amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, not always. What did she discover? How did she discover this, this artist? How did you discover the lady of Russia? What, what brought you to it? Uh, I knew about Nadia. I knew about Nadia Boulanger because we learned about her in uh, music school. Um, and when I was in graduate school, I wanted to do a female composers program, so I started looking up female composers, and I thought, well, maybe Nadia wrote something. And she did write a, a few piano pieces, but through reading about her, I discovered her younger sister. And that's how I found these. So you see, education is really good. <laughs> Anything else? I'm so grateful, by the way, for all of you taking part because I think that's that makes this whole thing very happy for me because it gives me more things to comment about and also for Kelly and for, for us as well to to come away with. I just want to say once again that a class like this is really there is no master except what we're working with. And that is with great music. And sometimes great music could be new music, too. Have you ever thought that at one time Beethoven performed things that no one had ever heard in their life? Artists have painted things that no one has seen before in their life. Writers have written things that they have never said before to anyone. Everything is new at one point. We're often told that there's nothing new in the world, but I don't believe that. I think we all have our own responses, we have our own sensibilities, so we do have things to offer and to say. They may have been said in other ways, but still we all, all of us, have that ability to do. So whatever you can, whatever way seems to be important for you, create something. Whether it's a garden, a lot of people love gardening around here, we have gardens too, we love them. Put down some words just in an arbitrary fashion. I have a little, what I call ops and eeks, which are little things I've heard or little things that spur me on to think something. I'll put those thoughts down. It's, it's good to get them out. Um, I think, in a way, that's what 
education is beginning to discover as well that we've too long, in some instances, not all, but in some instances, neglected the arts. Because the arts demand expression. Whether it's in music, whether it's in words, whether it's in color on a canvas, whatever it may be. Um, whether it's just singing, letting our voice, whatever the voice may be, may not be as beautiful as some of the birds we hear, but sing, whistle, whatever it could be. All those things are powerful, creative things for our own heart and soul. And some people think that music is a real voice of the soul, too. So I, I think that's one of the things that I'd like to at least mention, since I have a little platform here today, and such wonderful talent, too. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, it's a very interesting piece 
Uh, we, maybe we start with that. Why not? No. So, Forrest Howell. So this is a nocturne that was written by one of my classmates at Michigan named Michael Kropf. And uh, we met actually this last uh, semester. Uh, we were paired together on a new music project. So he wrote a piece for piano and for saxophone. And we recorded it and uh, I just fell in love with his music and I, I asked him if he had some piano music and he said, yeah, I have this nocturne that you should play. And I uh, got the music, and I just I, I love it. It's it's quite a remarkable piece. I don't know. What's wonderful is that composers are always saying, "I never had my music performed." So I am grateful to you, and I'm sure Michael is as well. This is a nocturne number three. So there are two others before this one I take. Yeah. And two after. And two. So there are five nocturnes. Obviously, he loves nocturnes, so <laughs> they're vital. Thank you. 
tell me what you think. And what do you hear? We heard water. We heard wonderful images. But in this case, it's called Nocturne, which of course has some kind of a reference to night, to the evening hours. Passing of time. You know, it's interesting because the word that the composer used at the very beginning is wondering, or wondering, wondering, uh, which I think says something as well. It's something I want to talk about too. What else? Right? It's very interesting. Respite. Sorry? Respite. 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 Long term rest. Yes. yes. Lots, of, lots of hell of notes. Is it is it right? Yeah. Yes. To me, it was going to sleep. Going to sleep. And and you're not quite asleep, and you're saying, "Oh, I got to remember this for tomorrow." <laughs> and here's what I didn't do today. So there was these these ups and downs in there where oh, I did, I did and he ended up where he went to sleep. <laughs> Finally, he gave up on what he had. Yeah, well, but that's what I heard. Well, that's what it is. You know, it's not that necessarily music has some kind of a real visual image ever. It's not necessary. But it is also necessary for some of us to have that kind of feeling, too. So I, I have no problem with that. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that maybe the composer also has some of the same things in mind. What do you think? Yeah, um, when I when I talked to Michael about this piece, um, he told me he was finishing his undergraduate degree in composition at NYU, and he was living at home. So the only time that he could uh, write music was at night, and uh, he was trying not to wake up his parents. So there were a, a series of nocturnes that were created uh, in that nocturnal. Process. He obviously had a lot of that ability if he's written five. <laughs> so that's that's very interesting. Yes, Sandra. I love chord structure. So in listening to that, what occurred to me was kind of unpredictable. So sometimes it's something like he was maybe toward jazz or something like that. And it was going to be a jazz piece. And then there were times it felt like it was a hymn. Exactly. I felt that too. Yeah. Particularly the, that last. Uh, that last theme, maybe we might call it. Yadi, yadi, That's something like, even, even the chordal, even the chordal structure is, is like that. And actually, he repeats that, repeats it, repeats it. And even at the very end, he finally has it as well. Good. What else? There's a lot of what one might call pedal of these octave notes. I mean, even, even though at the very beginning it's not I think the tempo is a little bit stagnant. A little bit stagnant. 
Here we are. When we have a note, for example, like this, like this opening. Whatever the notes are. What happens after that F? This is F. What happens after that A flat? What does he do? He goes down to B flat. He's not on one all the time. I mean, the opening three bars, for example, is in three, three, four. One, I'll play it a little faster. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, one. Two, three. One, two. Provides the, the tempo, the position of chords differently to it. I think it gives it life. But we maybe need to hear that a little bit more. In other words, I would like to hear it. Then you join the right hand with that. So, in other words, to my mind, it takes a little too long to get there. Yeah, pianissimo. Sorry. 
if the tempo is not free, we don't hear all that sleep and That's it's a wonderful piece. So glad to play it. Forrest also does some other music too. But I want, want you to hear a work that was so interesting by Boulanger. Why don't you hear a work that's done by a composer living today, whose music may not be heard very much, but by God it can be heard right here at Ground Top by somebody who brings it. I'm thrilled about that. Thank you for that. But you're also doing something else. I will. Let's hear some Chopin. Or would you like to? You know what I'd like? I would like to talk about the opening of the Polonaise. This is a wonderful piece, and I want to, of course, to talk a little bit about it. We, we won't have time, unfortunately. Oh my God, the time's already over. That's all right. It's okay. I'm not paid by the hour. Okay. I, want, I want you to hear the opening of this Polonaise Fantasy, which is an incredibly wonderful work of Chopin. Um, it has a lot to do with what we've just been talking about in this piece, about the timing of things. And I want you to think about, we've talked about this a little bit too, that it seems to me that that's where, in the work that you just played, the composer said one word. In this piece by Chopin, his indication is allegro maestoso. We have to create something called maestoso. Well, what is that? Chopin also says at the very beginning, it's the tempo or the, the indication dynamically is only forte, not fortissimo, not agitato, but only forte, but we have to create that sound too. Anyway, let's see what you can do with it.
else have to see you? Is there any, any connection that you that you have?
wonderful what we call the August Cable Series, where we have great events as well. Not only concerts, we have forums on poetry, one of the best in America. Forum on hers, which is interesting. Certainly one of the few in this area. A wonderful forum on theater, usually every year the theater forum has one country or one playwright that they typically hone in on, or one idea. Even one year it was brought there. So, just remember Festival Hill is a great oyster, and it needs to be opened by you. And we want you all to open.